أسعد الله مساءكم جميعا بكل خير يسعدني أن أرحب بكم مرة أخرى في متحف المتحف الوطني اسم يورينا وأنا مدير المتحف الإسلامي وأسعدني أن أقدم لكم المتحدثين الكرام أود أن أبدأ بتقديم منصف الجلسة توم أتكنز توم هو المدير التنفيذي لمركز الدراسات الفنية في كلية نيويورك في 2006 شهد بناء متحف كاسل في بوست كوليدج لمتحف مدينة نيويورك وشاهد كثير من الأعمال الفنية إضافة إلى التعاون مع متحف الفن الإسلامي مع هوفون وهو معنا اليوم في حلقة النقاش وهو قيم متحف متزح في نيويورك سيتي إضافة إلى أنه مع ريتشارد ورمادار الست سنوات الماضية كان قيم ببرنامج الحوار في 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 نيويورك وكان منتشر الفن العام في متاحة قطر سنرحب بضيفنا الكريم اليوم ونمتعه كنت على وشك أن أبدأ بالتعريف بنفسي ولكن ما قامت بكل شيء. أود أن أشكر الحضور الكرام ومتاحف قطر ويورينا مديرة البرامج التعليمية والحوارات والرؤية في المتحف هنا. إضافة إلى الشيخ المدينة التي دعونا بحضور هذا الافتتاح. الجلسة هي جزء من برنامج عدة حلقات ومنتشر وستسلط الضوء الآن على مؤتمر الشعوب سيركز حديثنا عن It will discuss the different roles artists assume, their interactive interaction with the public, the roles of new technologies in communicating with audiences, and the sense of public service and engagement with society. Has the model of an artist changed, and are there demands on the artist to be public figures, if not celebrities? To what extent are artists engaging with their public, and how? Do they feel a responsibility to con contribute to the community? Or is it essential to keep a critical distance, especially in today's networked, hyper-connected? To bring together such distinguished panelists, uh, artists Oliver Lyson, Jeff Koons, Doug Aitken, Philippe Pereno, local artist uh, Gada Kata, who uh, did an absolutely beautiful uh, work at the fire station called A Blessing in Disguise, which was commissioned by the Public Art Program as part of the uh, marking of the one-year boycott. Uh, one year anniversary of the boycott and I'm truly delighted that we're also joined with uh, with Maya Hoffman who is uh, a philanthropist an incredible collaborator producer of artworks and the visionary behind the Luma Foundation and Luma Arl which will be a major new arts and cultural center uh, in the south of France which opens in 2020 Maya is also very much an international figure and so it's seen and witnessed firsthand the kind of explosion of uh, art spaces and the changing role of artists over the last couple of decades, certainly. And, uh, and we thought it was good to sort of mix. Now, what we're going to do here is I'm going to start, I'm going to have a few prompts, uh, relatively simple questions. Um, I'm sure with uh, our distinguished guests, we'll have very complex answers. I, I, you don't have to answer all my questions. You can actually also react to each other, which I think will be interesting. Um, I'm going to start with a relatively straightforward question, which, and, and we'll move through the panel. Um, I want you to consider, that's a simple question, uh, how do you consider audience in your work and what forms of public engagement uh, does your work take? And I think we'll start with Oliver, uh, who is early projects actually uh, always had your in the title, your surroundings, um, and so thus situating the viewer within the work. So. Let's start with uh, Oliver Lesson. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thanks for having me. Am I am I mic'd? So I uh, thought of uh, when I titled my work, starting with your, it, the idea was obviously to encourage the person engaging in art or looking at the work um, that they would have some 
something to say as well. And the way they saw it would not be something I could separate from what was, in my view, the artistic potential. Um, but I guess, I guess um, the point here is that, um, especially when we are talking in the context of our institution, I think it very much has to do with trust. Uh, do you trust people to be smart enough to look at the work that, that I make in my case, or do I think that I need to tell the work what to s tell the people when looking at the work what to see? And obviously, I would very much would like to think that people are, in fact, smart enough, uh, and uh, this should be uh, how I should also present the work instead of trying to make rules on the expense of the experience. I should rather encourage people to take agency and s sort of co-produce the experience themselves. So the viewer or the participant in the artwork is very much a co-producer for me, a person who has agency and also has the potential of even alter the narrative uh, and drive it into a, a more personal and subjective uh, experience. Um, so I would normally not, when talking about art, separating, I would never separate the viewer from the artwork or from the context uh, in, in, for that matter. So all these things together, they for me would sort of constitute what I would see as the artistic uh, potential. And could you give an example of that? You uh, so, um, so when you uh, look at well, an example of my work, so I, normally I don't like talking about myself so much because where I come from, that's considered uh, not so not so nice. But nevertheless, um, nevertheless, I mean, I think if you, I had a very exposed exhibition in London some time ago, 10, 15 years ago, called the Weather Project, and I used that example because. I just met somebody who actually saw it uh, here. And, and the point was that I thought it was interesting that people both had a highly intimate or very individual experience of it. And some people had a, should I say, a very, um, sort of a very, uh, should I say, like a contemplative experience. And some people had a very apocalyptic experience. So in that sense, there was very, very different views. And, and, and I thought what was interesting was that the space, in fact, successfully hosted various views at the same time. So there was like not one correct way of experiencing it. There was sort of a plural or sort of a multiverse of opportunities within the same work. And in that sense, the work hosted differences. And you could say it was a very successful uh, democratic experience in the sense that it actually allowed for disagreeing without separating people. So I thought that's a good example of how, how should I say, uh, an experience which is highly personal doesn't necessarily polarize or exclude the person who are disagreeing with you. And I, I find that what, that is one of the, I think, the strengths of what we could call the cultural platform such as a museum, that you can actually be in a space and disagree with somebody and still be friends, which as we know in the world today is not a, is, it doesn't seem to a very, it does not seem to be a very popular concept, this whole idea of disagreeing and still be together. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, can everybody hear us okay? Can you hear me? I think it goes no. that way, the sound. No. Yeah, it is actually on, I think. Yeah. Well, I think you're on. I think you're on. I think you're on. Okay. Um, well, um, actually, um, it's interesting that you bring up the term uh, social responsibility. Because for me, my beginnings were actually deeply rooted with the, with the blockade that, that happened in Qatar in 2008. Uh, and 17, about two years ago. Um, it came out of this need for social responsibility, but also this need to um, uh, uh, have an outlet to, ha to deal with emotions, to deal with what was happening. It was a crazy time at the beginning. When it first happened, it came as a shock. So um, it began by just, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I, um, my work is generally uh, on, uh, I, I do political cartoons, I do social art and artwork, um, to tackle different issues, but I mainly started uh, talking about our local issues beginning with the blockade. Um, and uh, it was an idea that we wanted to laugh. Let's bring joy. Let's, let's laugh about the situation. And the so social media was the actual battleground and battlefield where all the communication was happening, where all the hate was kind of being spread. 
So um, it, it began by, the, by just like posting one or two, like just a few works, um, uh, talking about the different issues. And within, uh, like within days of, of, of constantly doing it for, uh, for a while, it became this uh, widely spread uh, uh, viral images that were kind of shared like uh, throughout uh, Qatar. Um, <clears throat> and it was just nice because it, it proved that there was like a gap for this uh, type of work or uh, at that moment in time, which served for a, for a certain purpose. Uh, people wanted to communicate these emotions, not necessarily knowing how, and uh, social media uh, methodology to it, you can, and, and, and that becomes the, the, the gateway into talking about certain issues. I'm gonna jump, it's surprising uh, what you were saying just before. There are more connections with Jeff Koons' work than I uh, would have thought. Maybe I'll jump to Jeff to, to talk a little bit about how you consider your audience and uh, public engagement. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I have to say I understand that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the audience, uh, the viewer, finishes the narrative. And, uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, but I, I also have to, uh, that I have a great desire though, that uh, when I make something, usually a lot of feelings and sensations are involved in making it. And so there's kind of a certain vista or a certain point that I would like to take the viewer along to, to a certain point, and then, uh, then okay, they can go anywhere. But I have a desire to get them there. And it's just to kind of feel those feelings or, to at least what my intentions were to try to get across. Uh, but then, yes, uh, they're going to, to finish the narrative. I think one of the reasons, too, that I may have that interest at this time is uh, I'm alive. And I know that, you know, in the past, uh, not in the, in the future, there's going to be more and more distance from actual any of what my intentions were ever really being uh, uh, known. And so it'll become more and more distant from what those intentions may have been, the personal ones, just. Uh, 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 but, I, but the viewer does finish it. And the art is how they finish it. Because uh, when you make something, it's about the artist's uh, journey, the artist's transcendence, the artist reaching their potential. And, but when you finish it, it's about the essence of your potential. Uh, that's what the art is. It's, uh, uh, the object is irrelevant other than uh, your own takeaway from it. And that, that takeaway uh, uh, is your own uh, sense of uh, essence, of, uh, of what your future can be. Maya, you're, uh, you're currently in the, in the middle of a very large uh, construction project, one that has also been opening up over time, so there have been a large number of exhibitions over the last five or six years within now, uh, culminating in the opening uh, sometime next, next year. Uh, but it's not just an arts center, it's also a cultural space, a public space, a transformation of a town, perhaps even a transformation of a region. Uh, how do you consider or how have you considered audience uh, in, the, in the development of this project? To consider the, the construction? Why, it's the question, why, why did we do a center? To show, um, to just uh, host, um, host the viewers or the audience for art that is produced today. Uh, yeah, it's it's a long endeavor. Just to give you a little background, it's actually ten years in the doing. The size has nothing to do with what is happening here, but if you consider that the town of Arles is uh, by itself, it is actually a big project and it's transformational for the whole uh, town. Now, I didn't really understand the, the sense of the question, but this is okay. I just think that uh, you plan something and then you go, you work at it and then you finish it, it can transform on the way, be it construction or be it uh, um, artist commissions. Uh, I love to work with artists directly. Actually, I knew everybody here except uh, Gada today. 
So I'm really happy to meet you. For me, Likewise. personally, if you want to know personally, uh, the journey is really with the artist is much more interesting, or with an architect like Frank Gehry, actually, too, is much more interesting than any work I could do uh, in an office or any work I could do with uh, other people. That's all I can say now, and maybe I can continue a little later in the conversation. Yeah. Doug? Yes. Hi. To follow the question, I think you have, don't just talk about, you have a number of projects that are clearly public projects, that are clearly aimed at creating a kind of experience for, for large audiences. Yeah. And you also have your other work too. So maybe talk about the difference maybe between those two. Well, I think the thing that uh, Jeff work? said was very interesting, the idea that the viewer completes the work. And um, you know, I like that idea that you know, the, the artwork is a door. It's a kind of, it's an entry into a kind of language of concepts, of experiences. But I think also the, the other aspect that, that I'm very interested in is the empowerment of the viewer. And the idea that the viewer encounters something and you know, there, there's all kinds of artworks, you know, whether they're, you know, passive and wall hanging, or whether they're experiential and you seek them out in the middle of the desert. And I think that artworks are like frequencies. There's different frequencies, different pitch that you can find. And I think the artist really kind of tunes that frequency for the viewer, for that, that specific artwork and idea. By what I'm talking about, I think that, that, that one of the things that I'm obsessed with, the viewer becomes, the viewer goes inside the work. They go inside the idea. They kind of eat the idea. Um, looking at different approaches to, to how the viewer can um, confront the artwork that's not passive. Yeah. Philippe, you come from a very, very different position, I would think, right? Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about your, the relation of your work to, to the audience. We had a, uh, we did an exhibition at the Park Avenue Armory together. It was uh, a couple of years ago. It was one of the most beautiful, uh, critically thought through, uh, super, super exhibitions. It was the most unpopular exhibition we'd ever done, uh, you know? And uh, our numbers dropped dramatically. And I thought that was fantastic. Um, and I felt that the uh, audience, uh, the, the visitors to the show, actually truly engaged with the work. It was a it was a project which also slowed time down a lot of times. With Philippe, he's thinking very very critically around uh, what what needs to be seen, when, and how long that needs to be, be seen, and then how does that then play out in terms of other works within an exhibition. So seeing a work, uh, an exhibition of Philippe's, can last two hours. It can last. 20 days, you know, uh, and uh, it's unforgiving uh, in, in, in that manner. Um, and I feel also with Philippe, and correct me if I'm wrong, you often create the work for yourself in dialogue with what you've been doing, what you've been thinking in relation to the historic body of work, but constantly challenging the conditions of exhibition. That's why I'm different than yours. <laughs> At the moment of paranoia, I think. <laughs> I'm bold. Um, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, no, I mean, I grew up with Doc and, and Olafur and just met Jeff, but I, you know, but uh, I believe we, generation of artists, we believe that uh, there were distinction to make. That's something that Liam could have said, a dialectical distinction between an audience and the public. An audience is somebody with a, is a, is a crowd who knows what they get and you know how to address it, you know how to address them. And the public, it's, uh, it's a collective that gets to be formed around an event, whatever the event is. So there's a bit of a difference between two. In the visual art world, pe people call viewer rather than audience versus public. You know, it's viewer. So, and as Jeff said, yeah, the viewer is interesting, the post Duchamp idea of the, the viewer finishing the work is an interesting idea. But I think it's today it has a sort of a, it resonates slightly differently because we have a, we have so much less attention giving to form or to the other. When I did a film on Zidane with Douglas Gordon years ago, I remember people asking questions about how do you feel like whatever you know, to, to um, make this film and why did you do it and stuff. And I answered quite often that I never spent so much time looking at one face for so long. Like I never watched my mother for an hour and a half, ever. 
So the idea to question time is, uh, is, uh, is also to question the time. And you, uh, you watch, let's say, a great film in Romanian with subtitle in, in English. What you want to do is you want to cut the head, chop the head of the person in front of you, you can, because you can't read your uh, subtitles. That, that in audience response you have, you know. When you are in a museum and walking through a, a room, you are with some people who were there before you, so they know more because they spend more time. You know, they're in advance. And, uh, and I always like that kind of like different perspective. And uh, so I work in this realm of uh, exploring those notion of attention into a space. Attention you spend through an object with somebody else. Object being, most of the time in my case, quasi-objects, are incomplete and unfinished. So, uh, uh, object, to say it differently, object without an intuition context, is just a big ball of rotten pitches. Mm. 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 There have been a, a number of uh, articles recently, not particularly positive articles, but uh, articles around the notion of Im the immersive space. Uh, you know, the engagingly immersive space. And, you know, in a way, this museum is an immersive experience. You know? And even the word experience has its issues. Um, and I want to ask uh, the panelists, art and entertainment uh, with immersive art experiences. Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I feel still very challenged just by the kind of experiences of more traditional kind of materials uh, uh, with work. The, uh, the immersiveness for me is really just life itself. And, uh, you know, philosophically uh, to try to delve into, you know, what what is possible, what the potential uh, there is for an understanding of um, how to make a gesture that hopefully uh, has some meaning to it that uh, can help create a, a greater kind of uh, width of life uh, for myself, a greater understanding, but at the, uh, the same time to be able to make something that has meaning to uh, the community. And uh, so that immersiveness for me is still much more involved with going inward and going outward within this space. There, I know there are new materials that are uh, presented, but I'm still really challenged just philosophically with the idea of the inside outside. Doug, you, you've made a, a very, very beautiful uh, installation in Gallery 9. It was always commissioned uh, as part of telling a narrative of the, the story of Qatar. Uh, and it comes, and Doug's work was commissioned specifically around the uh, discovery of oil and gas and became a geological um, narrative. Um, and I know that you've done a number of projects also with us in art, um, uh, making a very beautiful film around the landscapes of the, the Camargue region and the Provence and the city of Arles. Um, uh, uh, what, you must really know what that threshold is and, and consider it and think about it and, um, and sometimes question whether, whether you're making art or not making art and does it matter? I, I think uh, you know, kind of where the conversation is going kind of brings up another subject that to me is quite relevant right now, which is the idea between the physical life we live and the screen life we live. And, you know, this idea that really, you know, there was a moment earlier today at, at our hotel lobby where I looked and every human I saw was on a screen. And, you know, I think that also touches on an idea of immersion, but it's a different kind of immersion. It's not architectural or filmic immersion. It's the idea that we're become so um, articulate at swiping into alternate realities or fictional realities and kind of merging them with the physical reality that we live in. You know? And I think that, that um, to me, that, that touches on a very interesting question in art in terms of you know, where does art navigate in that landscape? You know? And I think that 
um, all the artists here are working in very different ranges. To me, that's very fascinating in the sense that, you know, Jeff, you actually make images that are so reproducible, you know, that they just kind of, fit, they're like hollow in the wind. They just kind of move out. But Olafur, your images, you're kind of inside and you're breathing the fog and you're feeling the, the moisture, you know. Philippe is this kind of meta narrative where you're kind of moving through this cinematic narrative and kind of piecing together particles and words and experiences. And I think that, um, I think that, and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, know your work as well, Maya, we just met a few minutes ago. But I think that I think that this comes back to the idea that perhaps we're all searching for a language of navigation. And we're also looking for something that kind of gives us a sense of where we go from here, how we see the future. And uh, you know, much of that relates to time and how can artwork disrupt time and make us engage in the present. And I think that sense of being in the present is what allows us to escape from the screen life and to really re-engage in the physical life. So, just put that out there. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, there's a technician up there. Hello. <coughs> so, Tom, I just wanted to ask you, because um, Tom uh, actually works a lot with uh, uh, Qatar Museums as an advisor, so he's got to see kind of public art in New York and public art in Qatar. So um, in terms of public art, do you find engaging with an audience different, for example, in Qatar versus, Qatar, uh, versus New York? Or do you consider audiences uh, in, uh, in the for art? Myself. Uh, hmm. uh, well, one thing that's very different, um, uh, very, very different, is the fact that um, what we were doing in New York, it was a not, it was a not for profit um, institution. And uh, it was called the Public Art Fund, but it wasn't public and it wasn't, didn't really have much money at first. Um, and, uh, and it was also the time of Mayor Giuliani. I think you might know Giuliani. He was a kind of very famous mayor, um, and not a particularly pleasant man. And, uh, and we were, in, in a way, antagonistic to the, the, in, in the relationship to, uh, to power in, in New York. And Giuliani didn't like art. And, um, and in fact, his commissioners did everything to stop us doing what we did. And so, and it was also a time when there was no, not really a lot of money moving about. So that had its own challenges. But it also, so not having power and not having money uh, seemed to create a moment of a lot of freedom in a way. And, um, uh, you know, Later on, with a new mayor who was very generous to the arts, very, uh, the evolution of New York, that was a different environment and one which I felt, you know, probably two years in, you know, um, maybe time for someone else to, to do this. Um, and, you know, whereas obviously here we have a country, we have a leadership of that country that's very committed to art as a socially progressive um, message. I mean, the fact that we commissioned you to uh, make a work at the fire station, I mean, you have, you know, your work has some punch to it, it has some message to it. Um, you're a woman. There, so there are a lot of things going on there which are quite complex uh, and in a place where, you know, um, people have very strong views, right? And uh, so I think that's, uh, that's probably the, the, the most important um, difference. I mean, maybe I could come back to this with you, Oliver. We, we, I don't know if you know a project with Oliver called The Waterfalls. It was a project that Oliver and I were developing very much together at the same time as the weather project. And I just want to come back from Doug because um, you know, you're talking about sort of art being away from screen time, if a way. What does that mean? And a lot of Oliver's earlier projects, you, 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 know, you talked about the weather project. And the way you, I thought about it at the time, the way you sort of described it to me, was that you, it was almost messing with the phenomenology of perception. Like, what was it? It was really just a bunch of light bulbs, right? But people felt like this huge sun in the turbine, just a bunch of light bulbs, yellow. So it warmed a little bit more, but it was pretty simple. And smoke and mirrors. And smoke and mirrors. But it, you know, the smoke and mirrors, but it was, you know, it, essentially, uh, you, you know, you could create a situation by people perceiving something that wasn't actually true, right? Whereas, in a way, your work now 
you know, is, is sort of about truth in, in landscape, right? But at the time with the waterfalls, you know, uh, ultimately the waterfalls became a, spec a spectacular project in a very different kind of way, but also set up a message for the city, right? And maybe you could talk a, bit, a little bit about that as being very, very important artist, but also being engaged in issues much larger than uh, your own artwork. I think that it sort of ties the, the few. First of all, I think there is and has arrived with our generation, if I sort of squish us together a little bit, uh, the fact that there is an experience economy out there. There's an experience industry, and the whole idea of immersiveness has become a big economical sort of player. And I think it's just very important to just to state that obviously experience and immersive ideas are not at all an artistic field. It is obviously uh, been colonized or taken over or commodified or, or what should we say, capitalized and so on and so forth, right? So, so and, and, and it's hard to actually distinct sometimes, but, but I think it's fair to say that one can make a few sort of comments that generally speaking, the, the sort of experience industry, which is for profit optimization, has a tendency or it sort of leans into escapism, right? It drives the people, drives the pe people away from whatever uh, trauma they have to deal with on their everyday life, right? So there's the whole experience economy, like the wellness, the wellness escapism, right? So you go into wellness to get a little break from, from having to sit and talk to Tom, for instance, right? Because that's hard work. And so, and then I would like to think that on the, on the contrary, artistic uh, engagement would sort of, on the contrary, drive a more focused and, a, should I say, in, a, a kind of a critical inquiry of course, that has become harder now that the experience industry sort of sits on the whole field. But it would be also sad if then the culture sector or the art as such would just give it up and say, no, no, well, now that's gone. We have to then stick to, so it was, uh, I should just be a journalist instead and so on. So, so I think there is a field uh, out there. But, and, and, and obviously, we also see cultural institutions then falling into the escapistic handling of experience economy. right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's, a, it's incredibly murky. And then you, then you talk about, I mean, um, you brought up the waterfalls in New York, um, and it was interesting at, at the time um, um, I was um, then, um, thanks to you, Tom, uh, able to talk to the mayor, who was uh, not directly the commissioner, but it was, in fact, his city. Uh, and I said to the mayor, quite frankly, uh, listen, I would like to make a work of art, but it doesn't work if you only address the success criteria of this artwork in quantifiable terms. It, it's not interesting to listen to a mayor if he only talks about the numbers and so on. And that is going to make it very hard for me as an artist because it's uninspiring and it makes me feel like I'm, a, I'm being objectified, commodified, and, and essentially abused. So please stop, stop talking about the increase in tourism, I said to Mayor Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. And then he got a little grumpy, but next time I met him, then he, then he didn't do it, right? So mm -hmm. fair enough. I mean, maybe he did it when I was not there, probably. But all in all, we had a... We had an interesting, I think, relationship, and, and he, by the end of our relationship, uh, actually acknowledged, well, non-quantifiable success criteria, such as uh, having a good life in a city, also comes with dealing with things that are, uh, that are well, what is inclusion, for instance? What is, what is social cohesion, right? These questions. And I, I'm not saying that I changed the mayor a lot, but at least through the artistic uh, sort of inquiry, some of these topics was brought, and of, uh, not by me alone, but by, but by you, in fact, also, and the way we worked with, with the mayors and the uh, team. <coughs> so in that sense, I have a strong, confi have strong confidence that, let's say, art and culture, and, and you know, especially also the blurring. I, I have no problems with, um, I mean, I got to know Doc Aitken's work in a music video, and I was so excited to find out that, that you also had a very similar work of art as an as an artist, and it made perfectly sense that this was, in fact, totally connected. And that's why I wouldn't necessarily uh, polarize the, the sort of two, not to say that we should not be skeptical of the, should I say, the gloomy uh, sort of uh, uh, economical interest <coughs> of, of the experience industry. Mm. But all in all, I think it's a little more complex, as, as you would say, in France. Mm. Speaking of France, um, Maya. This is something that you face head on uh, it, it, as a commissioner, as, a, uh, as someone who's building a space for artists, to work with artists, but also very conscious of, you know, needing to 
in, in a sense, bring people in while you're also a champion of very advanced aesthetics. And maybe we could talk a little bit about the issues that you face with that and the challenges. Challenge, yeah, to reality. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, we, uh, I think they should, we, we, we still didn't find a language that is inclusive for everybody. Uh, when it comes to art, I, we don't even know what art is anymore, isn't it? Somehow, we all have our different, different um, um, definitions for it. Uh, yeah, art, um, we talk about <coughs> engaged art with artists of today that can maybe revive archives of yesterday. We, we are part of a long history. Every, every work or every commission is a discourse by itself. For me, it's about how to, to try to, to make an orchestra of things that are maybe very often uh, one man or one woman uh, concerts, yeah? Uh, make a, a polyphony where every little voice can have the same importance than the bigger voice. Mm. I'm always very concerned with having uh, this outlet that art or culture is the place where everybody can, can uh, voice himself and express himself. Now, how do I explain this? That's something else. If in these discussions we would have in this panel, which I love, and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I we would have uh, practical examples. It would be much easier for me to try to, to explain where I stand here. Um, Every day, if you build something in a town like Arles, we decided to, to go to the countryside instead of being in a big town. So we also take up the role of uh, education. And this is the, in the end effect, this is in the, in the end of the story, this is what I am really interested in. How to put more creation into education and how do we do we do we achieve to have a community, a community of artists, I call them, but artists can also be thinkers, they can be writers, they can be architects, they can be designers. How do we put all of this together in order to have this polyphony and have, a, have an impact in our lives? No? So I speak to the mayor, yes, I speak to the, to the um, French governor and the ministry, but I also speak to the inhabitants of all, and sometimes it works and sometimes it does not work, but in the end we are building and renovating buildings and also creating a new one. But what is really important is the program in the end and the content. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know if this response. Yeah. And Philip, yeah, with you, yes, very clear. Uh, you, well, you're not only working with Maya on, on all, but we've been talking about yeah. working together here in, um, in Doha, and you started to talk recently about wanting to, this is a bit of a pitch for all of you actually, uh, where we, uh, Philip had been talking about involving members of the artistic community, the uh, people who are at universities, younger students, inside a project, become generative of the project. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that, how you think about, not about the specific project, but just what role does collaboration play in being generative of an artwork? Uh, well, I don't exactly what be happening here. Yeah. And I change my mind. People always say that. But we, I mean, we artists change our mind to the last minute. You know, that the idea that being an artist, which is a bit of a nightmare when you get to start to build things in a larger scale than something that you can be built in a studio. But. Uh, the, the, the first idea I had was to, to, to do a reenactment of a show I did years ago in, uh, in Germany called Factory of Clouds. And I thought just by the time it would be quite something funny to bring back here. And um, so I started like that. And it consists in bringing people together to build something throughout, throughout the time of the exhibition. So it's something that I did years ago and I'd like to go back to it a little bit. So it's less about me, 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 but about trying to, con to create a context in which some, a form can occur. Something around that line. And um, yeah. Maybe we'll come back to something we were talking about earlier, which is really uh, about art 
being generative in, in public spaces, but also generative and of a different kind of role for artists. And Jeff, I want to ask you about, about this um, uh, because you know you created one of the great wonders of the world, the the puppy, um, one of the most astonishing sculptures certainly in my lifetime. Uh, but it also became an icon of uh, of a city, helped gen how transform a re an entire region along with the um, uh, along with um, the, the Guggenheim Bilbao. Uh, it's also and correct me if I'm wrong, it's also spectacular in a, in, a, in a way that I think nothing else, certainly I've been involved with, because I didn't do the waterfalls in the end, but uh, uh, certainly the most spectacular work I've been involved with. And, uh, uh, but also it's an icon, right? And it's, a, it's, a, it's an Instagram, it's a grammable moment. Um, actually, Oliver sent me a little uh, photograph I, I, of I, I, uh, puppy. I made a selfie with it. Uh, just last week. <laughs> I was scratching it, you know, it's very... <laughs> so I guess there's, there's, a, there's a few questions in here. Where one is the, you know, it also made you a celebrity on a level that was unthinkable prior, prior to the puppy. I mean, it's the most beloved thing and, and it probably has made you the most famous artist in the world. Um, and, uh, but there's also, it's interesting because you know, uh, we, we, did, we brought Jeff Koontz's puppy to New York City to Rockefeller Center. And after that, I got inundated with requests uh, for pub, public sculpture, for artwork in public spaces. Everybody came out. Everybody wanted art in the city. And, uh, and I would say, yeah, I've got this. Uh, yeah, I will do this. And they would say, actually, we want something like Jeff Koontz's puppy. And they happened to be... Uh, uh, I'd prefer to have something like Jeff Koons' puppy. And, uh, and that's would be thrown out of boardroom. And so, you know, uh, and I said, well, there is nothing like Jeff Koons' puppy. It's its own thing, right? Uh, and do you think your puppy also led to a culture of the spectacular? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> but I think that it comes from that culture. And I think that uh, in the art world, we, we forget that uh, artists over you know, the centuries have made uh, spectacular uh, pieces. You know, uh, Leonardo, Michelangelo, uh, Raphael, they would be asked by the, you know, the princes to, uh, you know, for a festival. Or you know, Leonardo's, a lot of the flying machines were for the theater. And uh, so, Artists have always been uh, accustomed to making things that are for kind of a public situation, kind of like a megaphone uh, type situation. But uh, when I made Puppy, uh, it was an intuitive uh, piece. Uh, it was after my Made in Heaven uh, work, and I wanted to, uh, to kind of just show the dialogue about uh, you know life energy and. Uh, you know, how birds will come and procreate uh, and the, they'll move the pollen around on the plants and there are bees there and all the life energy that's taking place, the life cycle, uh, the plants are planted and uh, eventually they die. And I think the work has a dialogue that, that grows into creating any type of structure like that. There are 60,000 decisions, each plant is a decision what type of plant it is, what color it is, whether there's two yellows next to each other, or whether it changes. And so it communicates uh, about control and giving up control. It communicates whether you want to serve or be served. And so the type of polarities, the balancing of, of polarities, I think the puppy uh, is having the dialogue that the, the viewer can look at uh, and embrace and accept a kind of the cycle of life. And we we're going to move more to arts, arts and technology. And I was thinking that uh, I was reading the other day that the Museum of Ice Cream in uh, Miami is a really cheesy little place, uh, but well worth visiting. And uh, but it actually is uh, in the top ten Instagram museums in the world. 
uh, just below the Louvre and uh, Mona Lisa. Uh, and uh, I just couldn't resist this with uh, Jeff to ask what is here. Is, do you think it, 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 there is actually a difference between high and low art today? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not for any hierarchy. Uh, I, I, I always uh, like to embrace everything uh, uh, that's around me, um, embrace all art. And at the end of the day, we're here talking about art. But what we really all end up caring about are people. Uh, that's really what the dialogue at the end of the day is about, sharing everything that we have about life's journey with each other. That's it. I think they, they maybe Tom, I think that instead of thinking of high versus low, I think it's maybe also a question of to, double, to what extent does what succeed <coughs> to express with some precision the emotional need of a person or a group or a society. And that, I think, carries some potential. So you have a situation where, where um, a person engages with a situation, a work of art maybe, or a political joke for that matter, and suddenly you have that, that sense that, or the person has the sense that, well, that, I have a feeling which, in fact, was articulated by engaging in this. So it was as if this artwork spoke on my behalf. I couldn't quite say it, but suddenly somebody else articulated it in language or form or in a puppy, and now I felt I said it. So it was as if the joke or listening to, if once, I mean, and this museum or a cultural institution should do the same, I think. It is not a place uh, which tells people what to say. It is, in fact, a place which listens to what people have to say. And you leave a museum feeling listened to rather than feeling spoken to. Mm. And that, I think, is the way to sort of, sort of define success criteria. And that might very well happen in low or in high or in uh, expensive or non-expensive. It doesn't really matter. It is to what extent do you have the ability to listen uh, rather than um, sort of tell people what to say. Ben? Not working here. No. Uh, you mentioned technology, which is actually an important factor in all of this, because I think it, it, it kind of changed the way people communicate with one another, whether it's uh, through art or other means. Because you find that responding to certain trends, responding to certain issues, you have to have like deep-rooted messaging. So do you use inspiration from actual work, which then you transform and add to, to, to then communicate with a wide range <clears throat> audience? Or then do you um, design and cater a certain message that you would like to spread? And it's very important to know uh, which audience you uh, sort of create your work for, because that ultimately um, responds to the level or um, the type of engagement you will receive. Um, uh, for example, if you look at trends that are uh, local and you respond to them, and, um, uh, and trends that are widely spoken through uh, an Arabic-speaking language, doing something in response to that trend, regardless of if it's a trend or not, um, if you don't do it with the right language or vernacular, you kind of miss a whole element there. And that's actually very important, just because um, the type of work you do or the medium you use in which to engage is very determined of the fact whether you consider your audience in your final outcome. Because uh, you, can do a, you can do a public work for a public sphere, and uh, the audience or the visitors or the people you're doing it for, let's say for a country, never asked for it. Like they, they and they're not, they're not asked, like they, they don't get to have a viewpoint on it. It's there and then they get to interact with it. Mm -hmm. Versus doing something where you actually want people to engage with you, forces you to, to put in like a new element. Um, whether it's imagery or uh, things people grew up watching, like using elements of nostalgia as a form of inspiration. I think all of these factors drive your, your, your audience and uh, context is uh, sort of very important in this element here. Yeah. Anything to add to Gada? 
You are not in Canada. Maybe I ask you, you know, so one of the, um, one of the issues I think all of you face to some degree is how we make art in a distracted age, right? And, and, uh, and in fact, you know, the strangest thing happened recently. Uh, you know, I was pre presenting a project for a space and, um, and the president of the organization went on this with her phone and she said, how does this gram and I was like, well, wow. like, so now our, the, the, our uh, the judgment of whether to move forward with this project is how does it look on Instagram? Like literally look through this to the world, you know? And it's kind of funny last night, you know, there's this love uh, there, Mia. Uh, but you couldn't see it because everyone had that. Well, and, and so maybe I come back to you, Gather, with, you know, you're obviously thinking, the younger generation, do you make works for this, or do you make works for what's behind this? Or is that a false? But, uh, but I think it's false. funny what you say, because I was thinking about what Jeff was saying about the puppy, we say. Because I go to Bilbao quite often, so I spend time looking at the puppy in Bilbao. And I realized that, in fact, it's true, Doug say, like, it's, it's iconic, it's a picture, it looks like a picture, but in fact, it does change over time. It has a smell. The building of Kangari is not gray, but it's silver. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's yellowish. Mm -hmm. So the colors, the I mean, that are in real life are not the one that you see on Instagram or whatever, you know? The work has this life by itself. Whether or not you want to look at it, or you convey yourself that what you look is an image. But I think it's your mind that projects the image. You know, the work is what it is. As you said, it comes from the culture and exposes itself. And, the, and then if you decide to look at it as an image, then it's what it is, right? But in fact, if you decide to look at it as an artwork or something that lives by itself and exists and stands in a leak, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's complete, something completely different, which is funny. Mm -hmm. So it has a bit that, we know that this artisan artist that died in the, 19, in the 80s, um, Robert Filiou, was influential uh, fluxus artist. He had a funny, he had two great saying. One was like, he had a way to define his work saying, there are three ways to make an artwork. Use a, a well done, badly done, or not done. But the three entities coexist. They all have their own reality in a way, you know? One is virtual, one is what it is, clumsy, and one is superb. Mm. And they all exist in different temporality in a way, you know? And yet, another good line that was really a, quite poetic, he said, uh, art is what makes life more interesting than art. And I always thought that it really would feel better. <laughs> Maya, to respond to when, when you say uh, everybody uh, about Instagram or filming or, or looking through a screen, actually, you, it's not, you don't really see what you, what you see, you, you do it uh, turning your back to it with you in the picture, mm -hmm. right? So this is also another another twist that is really, really, I think, important. Mm -hmm. But it just brings us back, uh, it just brings us away from the topic of art, in my view. It's just something completely different. But the selfie culture is, is just about uh, this me and uh, how do I uh, move uh, in the world but not how is the world moving. You have, I, I'd see a difference in there really big time. I mean, you, have, you have three specific interests. One, one is art, one is human rights, and one is the environment. Yeah. And yeah. you have very specific programs in each of those fields. It's like I would, would more use art to make the two other causes visible, more visible. Mm -hmm. And this I did for years, maybe, maybe 30 years. Although I grew up in, a, in, a, in an ecological center, I grew up in environmental uh, questions and with scientists. And uh, so everybody, I studied biology. I, I will never understand what I do now producing art, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's all right. Maybe a bit, uh, one last question from me before we throw it out, out to you, uh, <laughs> to ask the panelists. But just a follow on from, from uh, Maya and these fields of art human rights environment. Um, do you, as significant artists and emerging artists, um, feel that art truly can contribute to solving some of society's ills? 
maybe start with Oliver. Uh, yes. And you have <laughs> No, I think no, I think it's very simple. I think art on a highly subjective individual level, like intimacy or some sort of, and obviously that doesn't work if you have a, I mean, sometimes it does work and I guess sometimes it doesn't, but fundamentally I'm sure that art can be transformative conceptually or physically or however, totally certain. But there's also another level in this, which is a more structural level. I do things that we artists all together, together with the cultural institutions, the curatorial marshal and the sort of, the, th the sort of um, macro-structural element that we take up in civic society. I think it is proven already that the, that the, for instance, the economical marshal of the cultural sector in Europe is 2.7 times bigger than the car industry, and that includes uh, the car salesmen also. I mean, that, so, so think of how big culture it actually is. So it would be sad to say that that cultural system would not have an impactful relationship with society. The jobs alone are created in the cultural sector. So, so I have no doubt whatsoever that, that art, both on that individual, like the micro, and on the macro, have a say. Mm. Dad, you are about to do a residency in Kuwait, I believe. Uh, uh, no, um, I did a residency in Paris, but Kuwait uh, is actually next month where there will be an exhibition um, of a work I did. Um, just to answer your question, I think yes. Uh, uh, I can give examples of how I've actually seen it firsthand happen uh, with my work. So in, uh, during my residency in Paris, I was um, uh, kindly invited to participate in a salon where female artists and writers and poets gather, and uh, I got the opportunity to share my work and talk about it. Um, <clears throat> everything I did came as a shock to them, whether I was a female, doing politics, uh, doing, uh, tackling like difficult issues. Um, it was very interesting to see how, I think for me, the, transform, the transformative part of all of this was the dialogue. I think uh, uh, art is a, is a very, uh, is not a serious way of engaging or starting a dialogue about something very difficult. It could be politics, it could be race, ethnicity, it could be any issue uh, we imagine or think of that is difficult to engage in conversation in, but it, art can actually kickstart that conversation and help, um, help uh, other people learn about a society or a country or, or even a political issue. Dan, well, maybe you could answer this, but clearly, you know, in Alfred's case, for example, with Little Sun, you know, it, you know it, also he found he found your work first as, uh, on a music video. You know, you've you, you know you've done crossover projects. Um, uh, you've also done charitable works. You, you also have a very progressive agenda in terms of your work. Uh, what role does celebrity play within uh, the culture of well, actually, social I, improvement? If it's, if it's okay, I wanted to rewind the question to uh -huh. the question before. Yeah. Um, uh, and you were talking about the idea of the image, uh, the role of the image in our society. And uh, I think you know, we'll look for head spoken to that. And um, I was just thinking all over this evening that really, if you look at contemporary history, you look at the 20th century, you see the creation of the image, the dissemination of the image, and the acceleration of the image. The image moves faster and multiplies. It's moving image, it's still image. And basically, we learn to adapt slowly to this kind of image intake, whether it's, you know, you're young and there's a newspaper and a magazine lying on the table to a television, like nobody even knows what a television is anymore, you know, and, and I think what's happened is as we've kind of come into the 21st century, um, we have moments of harmony and moments of discord with that image world, with the image plane that's outside of ourselves, and I think we're out of point right now, it's kind of a zeitgeist moment where the quantity of information around us is so enormous and it's accelerating so fast, but that also plays into the role of art and why we really kind of desire and demand to have culture in our worlds. And I think it functions in a way where the artwork often can break this acceleration. It can allow us to have stillness or a reflection or contemplation. It can also allow us to go even faster if we want it. Um, but I think that that's a very important aspect um, for all of what we're making. 
And I think the other, the other component to talk about when we talk about contemporary art is past, present, future. And I think as we, uh, as we stand here in the present in Qatar, in this auditorium with this bottled water, <laughs> you have to think of the future. And you have to think of where do we go from here and what is next. And to me, one of the great values, Daniel, and great value of art in terms of the relationship of art and society. It seems to be a very good moment to open questions to the audience, if there are any questions. The question over there, I don't know what we're doing with my... Qatar has just built this magnificent, very large museum, and there are more museums on the way, but there are also a crop of fantastic football stadia, stadiums, stadia. Um, can I ask the artists, are they, would they like to be involved in that? Can they see the football fans also becoming art lovers come 2022 when Qatar stages the FIFA World Cup? Well, I, I can, um, I mean, I, 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 I have one thing to think about uh, uh, football because I was, uh, who wrote the book, uh, the, veil of, the Veil of Innocence, isn't that like early 70s? moral ethics, and uh, there's a lot of studies that shows that best football judge would be the one who does not know what teams that he's judging, and doesn't know the players, he doesn't know who they are, what, how much money they make, and so on. And I was trying to um, re-articulate that for 2022, that one could train coaches in a country disconnected from any media, totally not aware of who is who and what team is who, and you could have a fair game. Right? And I thought this would be a great artwork to present, propose that you have the best judges not knowing who they are judging. And they wouldn't know, and then obviously they would have to not have the name of the country, which is well, so absurd anyway. Well, it's not about where they're from, it's about how good they play. So, um, so I actually am totally involved with uh, the question of uh, football, in fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. A question. Um, this is really more directed towards Maya and Gada, and then to you, Mr. Eccles, and it's such an unbelievable privilege to be able to see all of you. But when going through the incredible exhibitions earlier today, one can't help but be struck by the profound transformative seismic changes in this country. And one of the exhibitions pointed out there are 12 new buildings going online every day. The first Boys School was founded here in 1947. So my question really is, how do we ensure that in the art world and back to engagement, we have many more people, artists like Gada, on the stage and that the cure is? Good question. Um, uh, I think Qatar in the last maybe 10 years has uh, seen uh, a great uh, shift in, uh, in art. Um, you, we actually, um, uh, since opening this museum, uh, there, there have been quite a number of commissions, and a lot of the commissions we have, uh, 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 or that are in the museum on display right now, have been done by actual uh, Qatari female local artists. Um, a lot of them maybe are sitting here in the audience. Um, we find that a lot of artists in the, uh, in the past few years are actually female artists, and they kind of outnumber men, which was not exactly the case in 1960s when, when, when our art scene was kind of uh, flourishing at that time, which is, uh, I think is really interesting because that kind of also correlates to uh, women in the workforce. It correlates to a lot of aspects uh, of history where the past few years we've just seen this total uh, shift in, uh, in, uh, in how women are engaged in uh, different uh, active roles in society, whether it's artists or uh, politics or educators. Maya, did you, you want to ask Maya too? Yeah. Your question was about why we are not more women doing, t stepping up and taking a, a role. Sorry? How do we accelerate and leverage, you know, the incredible talent that we're seeing and have it become more socially inclusive? Um, 
I would say it's um, it's um, it needs generosity. Certainly needs means, which is something that you both have have here in this country. Um, it needs experimentation. It needs a lot of research. Actually, not everything has to be visible. I think a lot is happening in the not seen world, and it's it's as important as what you can show. It needs to show things that are unfinished, maybe processes. It needs a whole discourse around, which is not only seeing. Uh, uh, and I mean, I like spectacular, and I like um, um, ambitious. Working with Frank Gehry is actually putting me in this uh, category. Why do I work with Frank Gehry, or why do I ask certain artists who like to be out there? I mean, I would love to work with Jeff, but it didn't happen yet directly. Um, it, uh, it is to attract attention. I think to attract attention of other people who are not on, uh, in the art world already is, is really important, if it answers your question somewhere. So all these little touches can, can help to accelerate. But of course it would mean also put the money of the fashion world together with the, the creative uh, juices of uh, artists who are more engaged. It uh, calls for, yeah, for some men leaving a little more space to women. It calls for, for maybe a bigger corporation treating art not only as a side thing when you have big uh, uh, meetings Maybe like, I don't know if you know the, the World uh, Economic Forum in Davos, for instance. It would mean, it would mean that you can uh, treat art like a real force. This is all nearly here, nearly there. All this would encourage, I think, uh, creativity in, and uh, people wanting to become artists and art being uh, understood a little differently than it is now, more efficient. So well, I'm going to just say two things. Um, you know, it's inspiring when you're here, when you go to the fire station, when, you, you know, when you're in any art space in, in Qatar. Uh, yeah. It's very visible how many women are there, you know? Not only I mean, it's participants, this place is, but also... Yeah, yeah. These places where you can seed projects are really important. Yeah. And uh, maybe you don't need to speed it up. Maybe you just need to be patient. This country seems to be doing it. It's really more in the West, I would say. Well, that, that was the other side was going to be, well, I, I was sitting in my hotel room sort of tapping out some questions and I was like, oh, maybe I'll ask the panel about Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and decolonize the space. And, you know, which in America is like, called everybody to task, right? Like, everybody looks at the program and goes, how does my program look, you know? And not only how does my program look, but what the hell am I going to do about it? Because if I don't do something about it, I'm going to be out. But also, like, maybe I should be out anyway. <laughs> you know? And, you know, uh, actually in America, uh, it's interesting the moment in America now because you feel it's a tipping point. You, there's no going back. You know? There's no going back. And, uh, and so this new reality which we are engaged with, and there's also big questions, I think, even in the school I, I, I run, uh, at Bard College, where people, they don't just want to be included, they want to have some power in those institutions. Yeah? So forums for uh, you know, really democratic changes within institutions in terms of uh, power, representation, and economics, they're absolutely upon us right now. And, uh, yeah, so, but, <laughs> time to leave. No, no, I'm saying that I feel, I feel it, I feel it, Tom. You're going to be fine. You are so, um, you're so generous anyway. Don't worry. Another question. <laughs> Maybe a last question. <laughs> One more question from the audience? Your turn. <laughs> Down the front here. Yeah. Just in an era of uh, mass information and this idea of multiple perspectives, how do you feel about art in the future taking more of a, a sort of a moral stance or in regards to the concept of truth and making sure that proper information is out there. Probably go on, Philippe. 
Art and truth. Jeff? Um, <laughs> I remember uh, I made a, a sculpture back in 1986, and it was Bob Hope. It was a little uh, sculpture about his tall. And I, I, I took it to the foundry and I told them it was a plaster I found in Times Square. It was a Bob Hope, but he had a large head and a very small little body. It looked almost like an Oscar type of uh, statue. And I asked if they would uh, cast it in stainless steel and you know, take care of all the details, okay? And I really tried to stay on top of everything. And they told me the sculpture was finished. And uh, so I went to view it and I was looking around and uh, everything looked really great. I picked it up and there was no bottom. And uh, I said, there's no bottom. There should be a piece of felt there that should be cast in steel too and polished. And they said, but it's the bottom. And it was, well, you know, if anybody ever picks this up, they're going to feel that I didn't care about them. That it's, uh, it's about them. I don't want them to lose that experience. The only reason to pay attention to all these details is to pay attention to them. That's what you care about. So, uh, morally, that's, uh, you know, when you try to make something, it's about communication and to... Uh, try to treat that person the way you want to be treated and to uh, uh, try to show respect to each other. No, I th show I, the viewer I, respect. I completely agree, Jeff. But I also think that um, it's a double-edged it's sword to say something that fits this context. But it's, um, it's um, I, would, I would like to think that, the, that art and, and the cultural sector as such has high moral standards. I was just re referring to, uh, to moral philosophy, the veil of innocence, as a good way to read. But I mean, I do think that, I, I, and I know it's ambiguous, I do think that um, compared to capitalism, it's fair to say that the decision made to shape this sculpture in that particular way was based on other values than this, the, uh, the, 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 commodity, the commodification of it. Right? So that's, I think, a, a fair argument. But it's also clear that the cultural system as such maybe hasn't fulfilled its own governance and respo moral responsibility. Because if you look at leadership in the cultural sector, you have a lot of old, white-haired, uh, gray-haired uh, 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 men. Right? And of course, we have had institutional criticism and a whole <coughs> fairly robust uh, uh, walkthrough uh, and so on and so forth. But at least in Europe, if you look across the, all the big institutions, it is pretty, uh, in terms of governance, it is lacking a bit behind compared to the private sector, uh, funny enough, right? So you have more uh, prog progressive powers in public sector and public sector than you have in the cultural sector. So, uh, so it's complex, uh, but, but it is worth uh, addressing. But I do think we also, as artists, uh, owe it to ourselves to also claim the position and say, well, this was made, made based on other values than what you see elsewhere. And if we don't dare to claim it and trust ourselves and to say, well, this is important because it's art, end of story, then we are underselling ourselves. We should just sometimes just say, well, why do you say so? Well, I say so because I'm an artist and I think this is a work of art and this is what I believe in. I don't think we also owe it to everybody to be able to justify our actions in, in sort of quantifiable language uh, in that sense. And I think there is a moral uh, responsibility there that we uh, need to, um, as artists, also take. Are there any lines that any of you wouldn't cross as artists? I don't know. Are there, Are there any moral lines or ethical lines that you wouldn't cross in your work? As artists, yeah. All, I mean, and I, I shouldn't be talking so much. Yeah, all, all the time, of course. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. I mean, I don't. Children. No, but can I just say, I don't think being an artist uh, means that you are outside of society or some on some kind of pedestal or disconnected from the legis legislative system, and and so on and so forth. Obviously, being an artist is just like being like one of everybody else. There's nothing particular about being an artist. Uh, obviously, I would like to think that the great luxury of making art gives me a certain 
position within that little uh, bit of field, but that doesn't make me any more important or give me the right to be any less responsible than anybody else. I think, uh, yeah, in the, in the context of the National Museum, let's give the final word uh, to Gerda. That's like a lot to think. Um, I just wanted to uh, briefly just mention something about the previous uh, your, your question. I think uh, if, if we if we if you look at it as a line, um, I think artists kind of uh, flourish or or love the fact that they can uh, always go out of the box or think out of the box or break a certain line. It doesn't have to be a moral line, but crossing it actually is what then makes them different or what gives gives them a platform to communicate whatever it is they want to. I think it's that's very important because if, if, if it's always safe, it, it's not necessarily going to resonate and you, you might not be uh, communicating what it is you want to. And I think the art of the crazy is like, oh, if you're crazy enough to think, I mean, um, and, and I don't mean it in a, in a negative way, I mean it in, a, in, a, in an actual positive way, whether it's the idea you're doing or the size of the work you're thinking of doing it or the medium to which you're doing it with. Um, that's, all, that's all kind of uh, connected. Thank but uh, I just want to thank uh, National Museum and Qatar Museums for having us all. It's a real honor to be in a panel with all of you, uh, renowned artists and names and uh, professionals. Thank you, thank you. all of you. Thank you.